Okay, <clears throat> welcome, welcome back. Um, <clears throat> this uh, morning we <clears throat> okay, so this morning we get to the point where we had the layman classification of random matrix models with um, with with real spectrum so <clears throat> here on this side we had models with independent entries. And here we had models with rotational invariance. And we argued that the intersection contains the Gaussian ensembles. So the ensembles characterized by a joint distribution of the entries of this form, well, in general, so these models do have independent entries but also the property of rotational invariance. And by virtue of the Rosenzweig and Porter theorem, these are the only ensembles that enjoy both um, properties. OK? So remember that these ensembles can come in three varieties, real, symmetric, complex Hermitian, and quaternion self-dual. Um, characterized by a Dyson index beta equal to 1, 2, or, or 4. So since we, we only have one ensemble in this intersection, it makes sense to give some special names to, to those. These are names that you will find everywhere in the literature on the uh, subject. So we have the GOE. This stands for Gaussian Orthogonal Ensemble. beta equals to 1. So a GOE is an ensemble of real symmetric matrices, so beta equal to 1, with Gaussian probability distribution of the entries. Okay? So the name is, again, slightly misleading. So Gaussian orthogonal ensemble does not contain orthogonal matrices. It contains real symmetric matrices that are diagonalized by orthogonal matrices. Okay? 
It's called Gaussian orthogonal ensemble, but it does not contain orthogonal matrices. Similarly, we have Gaussian unitary ensemble, GUE, beta equals to 2. This ensemble contains complex Hermitian matrices, which are diagonalized by unitary matrices and with independent Gaussian entries. And then, of course, you can guess we have a Gaussian simple symplectic ensemble for beta equals to 4. Okay? These are the only ensembles that lie in the intersection of these two uh, categories, models with independent entries and models with rotational uh, invariance. Okay? This classification scheme is, is very uh, useful. So every time you uh, come across a random matrix with real uh, spectrum, you, you should be able immediately to locate it on this, uh, on this chart. Okay? And you know from this, from this chart that if your model has independent entries, well, then almost surely it does not have the property of rotational invariance. And if your model has a property of rotational invariance, then almost surely it does not have independent entries. Okay? Good. <clears throat> now, can I raise everything here? Yeah. Good. So, let's go back to our uh, two by two example because it gives us some good mileage on the general n by n case. So, if you take a two by two GOE matrix, then that's exactly the example we started we started off from. So, this is a matrix of this uh, type with a joint distribution of the three variables of the form exponential of minus one-half trace of x square. Now, uh, the, the question you, you might have is, we have the joint probability density of the three uh, independent variables. These are real numbers. So what is the joint probability density function of the two eigenvalues. The two eigenvalues are random variables. They will be described by a joint probability uh, density. Uh, can we compute it starting from, from this input? Remember, this morning we computed, starting from here, we computed the probability density function of the spacing, but not of the individual eigenvalues separately. Now, <clears throat> if you wanted really to compute this object in, the, um, in the, the long way, let's say, you, what you should do is compute this integral. You take the joint distribution of the entries, and then you stick in two delta functions, one that says that lambda 1 is its expression in terms of the entries, and then the other one that says that the second eigenvalue and here you put the expression of the two eigenvalues in terms of the, of the entries. And then you perform this, uh, this calculation. This will be quite long and, and boring. Actually, normally you don't do it this way because there are quicker ways to, to do this, this calculation. But if you, if you wanted, in principle, this is, the way, this is the way to go. So if you carry out this, uh, this calculation, what you will find is that the joint probability density of the two eigenvalues has this form. It will be proportional to exponential minus one-half lambda one square plus lambda two square. And then you will have an absolute value here downstairs of lambda two minus lambda one. Now, this, this formula basically contains all we need uh, to know uh, about eigenvalues of, of random matrices. It has in itself all the information and all the uh, important points 
that we will need in the, in the following. You see, here you have a Gaussian, Gaussian weight. So if this term here was not there, then the two eigenvalues would be just simply independent Gaussian, Gaussian variables. Which means that basically the eigenvalues, if this term was not there, but even when, when it is there, it means that the eigenvalues don't like to stay very far away from the origin. You see? So configurations in which you have two eigenvalues that are very large in absolute value are suppressed. They have a very low probability. But on top of this, uh, of this object, you have a term here that correlates the two, the two eigenvalues. It is a term that is proportional to the distance between the two eigenvalues. And now we are understanding why the eigenvalues repel each other. Because every configuration of the two eigenvalues where they get too close to each other have a vanishing probability. Okay? So here again, so this information explains in, in, in some in some ways, why we have level repulsion in a, in a GOE. There is this term here, lambda 2 minus lambda 1 in absolute value. Okay? Actually, you can now, from this joint distribution, try to recompute the, the level spacing distribution. It will be much quicker from this, from this route. And you, you see here, this object here will give rise to the factor S in the level spacing that is exactly responsible for the level, level repulsion. S times exponential of minus S square. Exponential of minus S square comes from here, but S is already in here, the spacing. OK, so uh, how uh, does this generalize to the case of n by n matrix? So here we have a 2 by 2 GOE. How is the joint distribution of the n eigenvalues for an n by n GOE? Well, I will not uh, prove it, but starting from, from this formula, you can sort of imagine how to generalize it to the n by n case. So I will give you this result without, without proof. So we have that for Gaussian matrices, so let's say GOE, GUE, and G, S, E, N by N. So the corresponding result is the following. The joint PDF of the N eigenvalues is proportional to exponential of minus 1 half summation I 1 to N lambda I square. So you have the Gaussian term that we, we expect. It's the same, it's the analog of this object for 2 by 2. Times, you have a product j less than k, absolute value of lambda j minus lambda k to the power beta. So I recall that beta is equal to 1, 2, 4 for GOE, GUE, and GS. So this product, if you write it explicitly, is for n equal to 2, this will be lambda 2 minus lambda 1, or lambda 1 minus lambda 2 in absolute value. For n equals to 3, this would be lambda 1 minus lambda 2, lambda 1 minus lambda 3, lambda 2 minus lambda 3, and so on and so forth. Okay. So you see that this, this term uh, here is quite... Uh, interesting because it is formed by product of all pairs of, of eigenvalues. It means that if you have n eigenvalues here on, on this line, this eigenvalue here, the smallest one, knows about all the others, including the one that is the farthest from it. So this system of, of random variable is the, um, the opposite of independent random variables. It is a strongly correlated system where every random variable knows about all the others. Okay. This, this makes uh, random matrix theory interesting in itself because it is a theory of strongly correlated random variables. So all the, all the classical tools, low of large numbers, central limit theorem, 
everything you know from this, the study of IAD random variables uh, stop, stop working uh, here. We need to devise new, uh, new tools. And clearly, if you take beta equals to 1 and capital N equal to 2, then you recover this, um, this expression uh, here. OK. <clears throat> So uh, in your, I ask myself the question: When was, uh, when did this uh, formula first uh, appear? So when was this um, actually discovered? And there is some uh, interesting historical observation. So this formula is a corollary of theorem two in a paper by. HSU, don't know how to pronounce it, which was published in the Annals of Eugenics in 1939. That's a pretty scary, scary title. And you can find, you can find it in the handouts on page 8, 9, 8, 9, and 10. And on page, on page 9, there is basically the uh, disclaimer. So the, the editors of the Annals of Eugenics are basically saying, well, you know, um, publication of this material online is for scholarly research purposes and is not an endorsement or promotion of the views as expressed in any of these articles or eugenics in general. Okay? But this is, this is the earliest appearance of this uh, joint, joint distribution. It's good to know for historical, historical reasons. Okay, so now that we, we have something interesting here to work, to work with, so we, we know at least that for the, for the Gaussian ensemble, we have the, the joint distribution of the, of the eigenvalues. Okay? Actually, I wanted also to make uh, another uh, observation, which you can understand uh, at the level of a, of a two by two matrix. You see, here you have three independent variables in the, in the matrix. These are three independent entries. And you only have two eigenvalues. Okay? In general, this happens also in, in higher dimensions. So you have an order n square entries and an order n eigenvalues. So you see, um, basically, this object here that correlates the two eigenvalues can be seen as the price you have to pay in reducing the complexity from an order n square in random variables, maybe independent, to an order n eigenvalues. So you, you decrease your complexity. You are basically throwing away a lot, of, a lot of random variables. But the price to pay is that now you are correlating them all. So even if you start with independent entries, the eigenvalues will always be correlated. So most of the, most of the, uh, uh, of the first part of this, this course will be about how to deal with uh, ensembles of strongly correlated random variables, for which the standard tools don't, don't work. We, we need an, a new, an entirely new set of tools. Good. Can I erase everything? Excellent. So now we, we ask uh, what kind of quantities uh, we can compute, uh, what, what kind of quantities are interesting to compute uh, in random matrix uh, theory. So we, of course we start with the simplest. So quantities of uh, interest well suppose that uh, we want to do like a numerical experiment which is also by the way in one of the uh, handouts so what I do is I generate an n by n real symmetric matrix, for example, uh, a GOE matrix, but we can do it with, with any kind of probability distribution for the entries. 
So this matrix is real, real symmetric. We produce it, we produce one sample by sampling all the entries in the upper triangle independently. The diagonal with variance one and the off-diagonal with variance one half. Remember, you need to do that, okay? If you take them all with the same variance, this does not belong to the GOE. Okay, so you produce this, this sample, this is one line in MATLAB, and then you compute the n eigenvalues. This will be n real uh, numbers corresponding to the first sample. Okay? So I'm just doing it step by step, like what you, what you really have to do on, on a computer. First sample, n eigenvalues. Then you do the same, the same thing uh, here. Second sample, so the entries will be in generally uh, in general different, and the eigenvalues will be in general different. N real numbers corresponding to the second sample, and you do it m times. So this is n by n, and this is lambda one m, lambda n. M. Okay. You produced all, all these numbers. So you produced N times M numbers, real numbers. It is operation. Now, all you have to do is you put all these numbers together in a, in a mega vector of size N times M. So you produce a mega vector, lambda 1, 1, lambda n, 1, up to lambda 1, m, lambda n, m. You have a mega vector of real numbers, and now you produce a histogram, a normalized histogram of, of these numbers. So your histogram will be peaked around the position around which you find most of the time, an eigenvalue. So if you do that, for example, for the GOE, you will find a situation like this. Here I have zero. And then you will have some sort of shape of your histogram, like this. Actually, you can find a more precise version of the sketch uh, in, the, in the numerical uh, hands handouts. It will be on page five. This is basically the sketch that you will, that you will get with, with a lot of wiggles if you try to do this, this experiment in practice. Okay? So there is no cheating here, no fuzzy maths. You just, in, in MATLAB, it's probably six or seven lines. Okay? You find this a lot of wiggles. So what kind of features do we, do we have uh, for, for this histogram? So this, uh, this histogram will be like symmetric uh, around zero. So it means that on average, you are as likely to find a positive eigenvalue as you are of finding a negative eigenvalue in, in, all, this, in all this mega, mega vector. The other, uh, the other feature is that here, basically, the, your histogram drops to zero at a position around square root of 2n. which means that if you take n like 100, it will be very unlikely to sample to have any entry in this, in this vector that is larger than root of 200, which I have absolutely no idea of how much is it. OK? So this is also uh, interesting, because this edge point grows with n. So if you take a matrix 10 by 10 and a matrix 20 by 20, there are two differences. The first one is that in the matrix 20 by 20, you have 20 eigenvalues, and in a matrix 10 by 10, you have 10 eigenvalues. This is trivial. Less trivial is the fact that in, in the 20 by 20 matrix, the eigenvalues are bigger. So you, you, you've got many, many more, but they are also bigger. They, they cover a wider fraction of the real axis. If you think about it, this is less, much less trivial to, to prove, but it is true. You've got more eigenvalues, but they're also bigger. Okay. Now, <clears throat> the shape 
of this histogram. For m, the number of samples very large, is called basically the average spectral density. It has this object has a lot of names. It can be like average spectral density, spectral density, level density. It has a lot of names. It is it is the same the same object. It is the shape of this normalized histogram when you're not, the number of samples is sufficiently large. Okay? And we call it rho n of lambda. So rho n of lambda, which is the shape of this, of this histogram in, uh, uh, in words, is the probability to find an eigenvalue around the point lambda. So this is the, the probability to find an eigenvalue around the point lambda, an eigenvalue in this mega, mega vector. So it is a probability regardless of which sample it came from. So we, we, don't want, we don't want the probability that the third sample, that, that the second eigenvalue of the third sample was around the point lambda. We want the probability of finding an eigenvalue anywhere in this, in this sequence and anywhere in this sorted order around point lambda. Okay? And this, this is given by this histogram because we are putting all the eigenvalues together. So we, we forget where they, where they come from. The uh, average spectral density satisfies, it is, a, it is a probability density, so it satisfies the normalization to, to 1. So the area under this histogram must be equal to 1. OK, so this is one uh, object that we, we know how to compute uh, numerically. Now let's let's ask the question: Can we compute it analytically? Can I can I remove? Okay. So let's let's leave it there for the moment. <coughs> so first uh, remark. So the spectral density rho, or the average spec spec spectral density rho n of lambda, um, is uh, a highly non-universal quantity. And I explain what, what this means. So the, this, the spectral density, this, this, the shape of this uh, histogram, is a highly non-universal quantity. This means that if you change the probability distribution of the entries, in general, this shape will change. And often, it will change a lot. Okay? So every ensemble, every joint distribution of the entries, will have its own distribution of the, of the eigenvalues. Okay? Now, the question is, can we compute? Can we compute it? So the problem that we have is, Given the joint PDF of the entries, can we compute rho n of lambda? I give you this object, which defines the ensemble. And I ask the question, can I compute from this object the average spectral density? In principle, if I do everything correctly, I should be able to compare this result with numerical diagonalization and find a good agreement, if I did everything uh, correctly. Because I can sample random matrices according to this distribution, diagonalize them, 
put everything together, form the histogram, and the result that I have from MATLAB should match this function that I have computed. Okay? So in, in principle, we have a tool to, uh, to check if we are doing something good or, or bad. Okay, now the, the situation becomes, uh, unfortunately, um, a bit uh, less, less nice. So remember our uh, original scheme, matrices with independent entries, matrices with rotational invariance, and Gaussian ensembles. Now, it turns out um, that random matrices work in the opposite way, as you might uh, expect uh, from your experience on random variables, like independent random variables. In the case of, independ the case of independent random variables is the easiest among all random variables. If you have independence, then that's, a, that's an, an amazing property that allows you to do a lot of calculations. The case of random matrices is completely uh, different. So matrices with independent uh, entries are super hard. So we, we don't know nearly as much as we would like to about matrices with independent entries. So in general, Rho n of lambda, the average spectral density, cannot be computed. So the spectral density, although, although you can simulate uh, these matrices easily and, and produce this histogram easily, for n equals 17 or 23 or 34, you don't know how to compute. You don't have an expression. We don't even have tools to compute this, uh, this object. Okay? So this is something for, for you, to, to, bring, um, you know, to bring this field forward. We will need some, some tools that maybe some of you can, can create to compute this, uh, this object. What we can do is sometimes we can compute rho n to infinity of lambda sometimes. So sometimes for very large random matrices, we have a few tools, not so many, that in some specific cases allow us to compute, but I put it in inverted commas, and I will explain why, the density of uh, eigenvalues, the spectral density, for n to infinity. This will be the topic of my second, second week. So in, in, during my second week, uh, I will try to deal with this type of, of problems. The main, the main tool that we, we use in this case is uh, replicas. So tools that are borrowed from the physics of spin glasses. But uh, the field of independent matrices with, with independent entries is uh, open in, in the sense that we don't, we don't know much about, about them, actually. The, the case of matrices with rotational invariance is much nicer. So in the case of matrices with rotational invariance, uh, the spectral density, the average spectral density, can be computed for finite n in closed form and also by taking the limit n to infinity, also for large, large matrices, clearly. So this, the main tool here will be the method of uh, orthogonal polynomials, um, which I'm going to describe for you tomorrow. If you use the uh, method of uh, orthogonal uh, polynomials, you will find, uh, <coughs> let me see, uh, there should be here, yes, on page 20, so on page 20 of the numerical uh, handout, I, I wrote like a small uh, MATLAB code, so you have uh, a GUE, so a beta equals to Gaussian ensemble, and here you have the spectral density, the dots are the histogram there, so numerical diagonalization of matrices, and the continuous, the continuous curve is the theoretical 
the theoretical result. So we, we have uh, an exact formula for the spectral density, and the two match very, very well. So the topic of tomorrow's lecture would be to how to compute this. Um, isn't it nice? I don't see enthusiastic faces. Cheer up. It's good, right? So you just diagonalize matrices, and then you have a function, and it works. Come on, be happy. Good. <laughs> OK, so this is very uh, super exciting. Um, so before, um, <clears throat> um, so the, OK, this was just a, a recap on the, on the scheme. I just erase everything. So tomorrow, I will introduce the uh, orthogonal polynomial uh, technique. Uh, next week, I mean in two weeks, we will deal with uh, matrices with independent uh, entries using replicas. Um, now I wanted to introduce another technique that can be uh, used to compute the spectral density sometimes in the limit n to infinity. Okay. So you see uh, n equal to 2 and n equal to infinity are often the two cases that we can, we can deal with easily or more, more easily. Okay? n equals 2 because we can do calculations explicitly and maybe try to infer from what happens for n equals 2 in, in the cases of larger n. And n equals to infinity because sometimes there are simplifications that, that take take place. So now I will try to introduce a technique that is used in this, in this uh, situation. Um, so first of all, let me define uh, the average spectral density. I defined it in, in words as the probability of finding an eigenvalue around the position lambda. But how can we define it in mathematical terms? Well. Um, I will give you the um, definition, and then so you have a sum of delta functions where lambda must be equal to the position of each eigenvalue, and this this sum is average over the ensemble. So in, this is in theory. Let's see in practice how it, it works. So suppose that you have the first sample of, of your random matrices. So this object here will produce a set of spikes at the location of each eigenvalue, lambda 1 of the first sample, lambda 2 of the first sample, lambda n of the first sample. OK? Just, just this object here, you just have to, to, to sum all the spikes at the position of each eigenvalue. Now, you do the same thing for the second sample. And you will have spikes somewhere else in general. You will have the same number of spikes, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7, and down to the mth sample. Yeah? The definition was that they are around something, but it's the exact place. Yeah. I mean, the, the, um, the point is that when you, when you take this, this average, this function, which is highly singular, uh, because it is basically a set of discrete uh, so sample by sample for finite n, you can identify exactly the value at which one eigenvalue is. The problem is that when you, when you take the average, so taking the average means that basically you are putting all these spikes uh, together, and the density profile will be basically higher when you have, when you have several spike, spikes around a certain position. So this object becomes a smooth function. Yeah, so this, this, this object becomes basically a smooth function of uh, of lambda 
And so it makes sense to interpret it as a probability density function. So the probability that you will find one eigenvalue around, so between lambda and lambda plus b lambda. Okay? Note that this, this doesn't have, to, it, it has nothing to do with the limit n to infinity. This is still valid for, for finite n. What is, what the, the, the problem is the, is the average. Okay? So when you take, when you take this in, in this direction, a lot of samples in the limit m to infinity, not the limit n to infinity. Okay? Good. So the question is, can we compute this, uh, this object for a, for a given uh, matrix model in the limit n to infinity? Well, we can sometimes, using a technique that is called resolvent, resolvent method, which I'm trying to describe uh, now. So the, the resolvent method is quite um, interesting. Um, so first I give you uh, a definition. So the definition is we define a certain function, gn of z, which is defined as follows, 1 over n, the trace of 1 over z times the identity, minus the matrix H. Or if you want, in terms of the eigenvalues, is 1 over n, summation I, 1 to n, 1 over Z minus lambda I. OK? So we define this uh, object. X doesn't need to be a random matrix. It can be a, you know, a fixed matrix. You can define it for any fixed uh, matrix. It is the trace of basically the inverse matrix of Z, the identity, minus X, which in terms of the eigenvalues is written in this, in this form. So, so far there is nothing uh, random. Uh, the important thing is that Z is taken to be a complex variable. So Z belongs to the uh, complex number minus, so to which we have excluded the set of the uh, eigenvalues, because otherwise this object is not, is not defined. So it is a function that is defined on the complex plane, except the set of corresponding to the eigenvalues. Okay? And this is defined for any fixed matrix. Now, what we can do if uh, x is a random, random matrix, what we can do is we can take the average of this object, it becomes because it becomes a random function. So we can take the average over the ensemble, and then we can take the limit n to infinity. And this object here, we defined a Mathcal G of, of Z. And this object is called resolvent. It has several names. It can be called Green's function. It has several names, but these two are, are enough for our purposes. So we have a random function, random complex function. We take the average over the ensemble, and then we take the limit n to infinity. Good. <coughs> so the claim is that this object is equal to the integral of the spectral density in the limit n to infinity times z minus lambda. So I will, I will show why, uh, why this, this claim uh, makes, makes sense. Uh, but this, this formula establishes a connection between the Green's function, or, or the resolvent, and the average spectral density in the limit n to infinity. So if we are able to compute this object for our ensemble, and if we are able to invert this relation, which is an integral relation, so it is not obvious that we, we are able to invert it, then we have access to this, to this object. So it turns out that in many problems, it is easier to compute this object than to compute directly the spectral density. So we, we use this indirect method to access the spectral, the spectral density. 
Of course, we have two problems. So first, to prove that this, this is true. Uh, and second, how do I in the invert this, this, re this relation to find the spectral density from the, the resolvent? Okay? Uh, you see, this direction is, is easy. If I have the spectral density, I can always compute an integral and find the resolvent. But this direction is hard. Because if I, if I know this function, how, I, how do I reconstruct the integrand? Okay? But it can be done. Yeah? Does it have anything to do with the dense function in the electrodynamics? Absolutely, yes. Uh, there is a very specific um, connection. Um, this, I think, we will, uh, uh, we will discuss a bit uh, in two lectures. Okay, because we will see this in, in a completely different, in an electrostatic cont context. So this, this will become, this will be, it will become cr clear why the name uh, is like, it's like if, you, if you can wait just a couple of lectures, this will become clear. So uh, let me give you, let me give you, um, um, uh, a proof of this, uh, a proof of this. OK, so first uh, we start from a finite n version of this, of the right hand side. So we take the finite n spectral density, we divide by z minus lambda, and we integrate over lambda. OK? Then we inject here the definition of the finite n spectral density. The definition is integral d lambda divided by z minus lambda, and then we have the average of 1 over n summation over i delta of lambda minus lambda i. OK? I'm, I'm not doing anything. I'm just, I'm just inserting here the definition of the spectral density for finite n. Now, the average and the integral would commute, because that's a linear, linear operation, so you have that this is equal to 1 over n summation over i integral d lambda delta of lambda minus lambda i divided by z minus lambda. This, this delta would kill this, this integral and reconstruct a z minus lambda i. So this object here is, is just the average of g n of z. And then you take the limit n to infinity to the left and to the right. So this is a two minutes, two minutes proof. Uh, mathematicians would not like it, but it works. That it is at least plausible that this object is related to this object in precisely this, this way. Okay. Are you convinced? Who is utterly not convinced? Excellent. Good. So um, we have established this uh, relation. Can I remove? Okay, so properties. Properties of the Green's uh, function or resolvent. So we have that g of z is equal to the integral of rho of lambda over z minus lambda. So if you take so the first property, if you take z in absolute value very large, what you have here is that downstairs, this object will dominate over 
this. So this, this term will dominate over lambda. So you can pull out a factor 1 over z. And then we have this object here is equal to 1 because the density is, is normalized. So we have that the Green's function goes for large absolute value of z as 1 over z. This is sometimes uh, useful uh, because this property is basically equivalent to the property of normalization of, uh, of rho. So when you, when you derive your function g of z, the first thing to check is that it goes as 1 over z for large modulus of, of z. So you need to impose that this coefficient is equal to 1. For example, you, you might have parametric case where you have here a certain function of parameters, and you need to impose that this function is equal to 1. Otherwise, your original spectral density is not normalized. Okay. Yeah? In, in the Gaussian case. Yeah. Yeah, excellent, excellent question. So the, uh, the, the right way to, to do it is to consider the spectral density where you have put your, where you have rescaled your eigenvalues in such a way that they are of order one. Okay? So for example, in the Gaussian case, you would rescale the eigenvalues by square root of n and your eigenvalues lambda i tilde would be of order of order one for n going to, to infinity. So the edge, the edges would not scale with, with n, and that's the, the that's the definition that I implicitly assumed for our spectral density. But that's that's a good point. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> good. So the um, second property, uh, it is the uh, generating function. of uh, trace moments. What does this uh, mean? You can interpret this object as a geometric series. So you take integral d lambda, rho of lambda, of z minus lambda. So you can pull out a factor of z downstairs. So this is 1 over z, integral d lambda, rho of lambda over 1 minus lambda over z. Okay? And then you can interpret this uh, object here as the result of a geometric series. 1 over 1 minus x is a result of a geometric series. So you can write 1 over z, d lambda, rho of lambda, and you have a summation, k from 0 to infinity, k, I call it k, lambda over z to the power k. So if you go like this, this will be summation k from 0 to infinity of mu k over z k plus 1, where because you have z to the k and the, there is an extra z here. And this mu k are the integral d lambda, rho of lambda, lambda to the k. So this is the limit n to infinity of 1 over n trace of x to the k. So the, the resolvent encodes all the moments of the spectral density. Okay, the integral of spectral density times lambda to the k, which can be trivially mapped into this object, the average of the trace of x to the power k. So all of these are encoded in, the, in G of z if you develop, if you make a Taylor expansion, a Laurent expansion, sorry, um, in, in z. Okay? So sometimes this property is also... Um, is also useful. But the third property is the most useful of them all. Uh, 
Can I raise it? Yes? So the third property is how to reconstruct rho of lambda from g of z. And uh, from, for this, we need a very important uh, formula which is the Sochotsky Plemej So this guy was Polish, half Polish, half Russian, meaning it was Polish when Poland was under Russia, and this guy is Slovenian. So he came from not far away from here. So the this formula is like this. So I first write it and then explain it. So if you have, if you have a, a rational function with a complex part, and you take the limit of the imaginary part to, to zero, uh, then the imaginary part of this object reconstructs a delta function. Which means that if you need a delta function in any of your calculation, you can always replace it with the imaginary part of a rational function. The proof suppose that you have phi, which is a complex function phi, which is a complex valued function. Defined and continuous on the real line. And then you take two numbers, a less than 0, less than b. So what you compute is integral between a and b of your function phi divided by this object here, y plus i epsilon. So you just take a test, test function. You divide it by this left-hand side, y plus i epsilon, and you compute the integral over an interval of the real line containing 0. Okay. Now, to perform this integral, you multiply up and down the integral by y minus i epsilon. Okay. So I haven't done anything, just multiplying up and down by y minus i epsilon. So the denominator becomes y square plus epsilon square. And the numerator is y minus i epsilon. OK? And now I separate the real and imaginary part of this object. So you have y over y squared plus epsilon squared yeah. minus i integral psi of y epsilon divided y squared plus epsilon squared. And now the, the theorem is basically established because this object here, in the limit epsilon going to 0, reconstruct a 1 over y term. 
So here you have an integral of psi of y over y. And this, this integral will be singular in general, because you have a divergence of the type 1 over, uh, over y at 0. Okay? So this integral in the limit epsilon to 0 is only defined if you take the Cauchy principal value. So the, the real part of this object reconstructs a Cauchy principal value. The imaginary part reconstructs a delta function, because you have a representation of the delta function of this, of this type. So delta of y, delta function can be written as limit epsilon to 0 plus of 1 over pi epsilon divided y squared plus epsilon squared. So this object here tends to pi delta of y. So this is the Cauchy or, Lo or Lorentzian representation of the delta function. So this, this formula is, is very useful because it gives a representation of the Dirac delta of y in terms of a rational function. Okay? So we will use it um, a lot. Why is it useful for us for reconstructing the spectral density from the uh, resolvent? Well, this is easy. So suppose that I compute my resolvent function not in z, but in x minus i epsilon. Yeah. Uh, this, this bit here. Yeah. OK, so you have a here, b here, and 0 is in between. OK, so when you, when you squeeze the denominator by sending epsilon to 0, so this object here becomes a y over y squared. So it becomes a 1 over y. So in general, for a well-behaved function, test function psi of, of y, if you divide it by y, this, the integral will acquire a singularity of the type 1 over y at 0, which is non-integrable. Okay? So the only way to make sense of this, of this, integral, of this integral is by taking the Cauchy principal, principal value, which means that basically you are interpreting this object as the integral up to, let's say, 0 minus epsilon plus the integral from 0 plus epsilon onwards. And then you take, you take the, li the limit from epsilon going to, to 0, which means that the two divergences on the two sides of, of 0 would cancel out. OK? <clears throat> so uh, if, you, if you now compute the um, resolvent, not in z, but in x minus i epsilon. So here you have the point x on the real axis, and you compute it here. Okay? Just you, you move off the real, the real line a bit. Well, this is by definition integral b lambda, rho of lambda, over x minus i epsilon minus lambda. This is just by, by definition. OK? And then suppose that you take the imaginary part of this object, the imaginary part of g of x minus i epsilon. Basically, here, you can play the same trick that we, have, we are playing here. OK? So this, this imaginary part will be this object here. So this will be the integral over d lambda, rho of lambda, pi times the delta of x minus lambda. So the delta function will kill this integral, and this will become pi rho of x. If you send, of course, epsilon to 0 plus. So eventually, the spectral density at the point x will be given by 1 over pi, the limit epsilon to 0 plus, 
of the imaginary part of the Green's function evaluated at x minus a bit of offset on the complex plane. So this is the inversion formula that we were, we were after. We can compute the spectral density at x if we know the resolvent in the complex plane. So it is not enough to know the resolvent on the real numbers. We need to, to, ha to use the complex uh, structure uh, of, of the argument of, of G. But by, by using this, this formula, we can reconstruct the spectral density if we know G of Z in the vicinity of the point X. Okay, so this, this will be our, our main tool because if we, if we manage to find an equation, for example, for G of, G of Z, we will solve this equation, find G of Z, compute it in X minus I epsilon, take the imaginary part, take the limit epsilon to zero in this order, divide by one over pi, and we will, we will have our spectral density. This is what we are going to do for the uh, Gaussian ensemble. We can, we can do a five minutes break now. So I will try now. Uh, <clears throat> OK, so uh, <clears throat> what I wanted to do now in uh, this half an hour, <clears throat> let's see if I, if I can, is to um, try to use this, this formalism to compute the spectral density for Gaussian uh, ensembles. Okay. Uh, in principle, you you don't need to to do this because you we have uh, much better tools for for Gaussian ensembles. But this is just for training uh, purposes. Just the, just to show you how we can put this um, this method uh, to to work in in practice. Okay. So G of Z for uh, Gaussian uh, ensembles. So the idea would be to establish an equation for G of, of Z, and then from, from here to invert this, uh, this expression using the sokotsky plemage formula and obtain the spectral density in the limit n to infinity. Okay? So we can start from the joint uh, PDF of uh, the eigenvalues of Gaussian uh, matrices that I gave you before without without proof. So remember, we have the Gaussian weight and then this interaction uh, all to all term, and Z n of beta is the normalization factor which makes sure that this is a proper joint PDF. So it should be normalized. To, to one. So um, <clears throat> Zn uh, of beta will be then the integral of d lambda 1, d lambda n, exponential of minus 1 half summation i 1 to n lambda i square. And then you have this uh, product. To the power beta. Okay, fine. So now, in in this uh, integral, we make a change of variable, change of variables. So I send lambda i into root beta n lambda i. So if I do this uh, this change of variable, what I get is that our normalization constant is equal to a certain number that we don't care much about. This, just, this, this number is basically just the product of, 
of these terms and some terms coming, coming from here, okay, times, and here comes the interesting bit. I can write this object in this form, the integral. So what I'm, I'm doing here, I'm basically raising this, this term into the exponential. So I'm re rewriting this, this object as exponential of beta over 2, summation j different from k, log of lambda j minus lambda k. So I'm only re rewriting this, this product by writing it as in, in, in the exponential. Fine? So why am I doing uh, this? Well, I'm, I'm doing this because if, if you do this, uh, this trick here and after the rescaling of the eigenvalues, then you can re rewrite this integrand in this nice exponential form apart from this n, exponential of minus beta h. Have you ever seen exponential of minus beta h before? Where? Sorry? So, let's write what is h. So h is one half summation i one to n lambda i square minus one over two n summation j different from k log of lambda sorry i different from j log lambda i minus lambda j. So look at this uh, very nice formula. This, this formula here explains why we chose the letter beta for the Dyson, for the Dyson index. The letter beta, we, we could have called it gamma or delta. But if we choose beta, then you recognize here exponential of minus beta h. So the Gibbs-Boltzmann weight of an associated thermodynamical system. And here we are integrating over the position the, the degrees of freedom, which are the position of your particles. So this object, which originally was just the normalization constant of a, a joint probability density, can now be interpreted as what? As the canonical partition function of uh, an associated thermodynamical system. So one of the uh, great adva advancement in, in, in the field was when people realized that the eigenvalues of random matrices, in this case Gaussian random matrices, but the the concept is, is much more general, can be viewed as an associated thermodynamical system. So we can treat eigenvalues as particles, as interacting, as a gas of interacting particles. And what is the, the corresponding Hamiltonian? The Hamiltonian contains two uh, pieces that are in competition. There is a quadratic part and the null to all uh, interaction part. So we have our eigenvalues behave as a gas of charged particles that are basically confined inside a quadratic well, so they cannot escape to infinity. But they are also repelling each other, like this object is repelling this one, it is repelling this one, it is repelling this one, 
So every particle feels the presence of, of all the others. So this is a classical long-range thermodynamical uh, system. But it is a long-range system, so it is not the standard uh, type of systems that we see in a, in a standard course in statistical mechanics, because every particle feels the presence of, of all the others. Now, then thermodynamics tells us what we should, uh, what we should do. So this type of gases is called two-dimensional Coulomb gas. Now, can someone explain to me why it is called two-dimensional? The eigenvalues are on a line, right? So why is why is it why is this a two-dimensional system? Yeah. So the interaction between particles is logarithmic. Okay. So Coulomb interaction is logarithmic in two dimensions, not in one, not in three. Okay. So we need to think about this as uh, a system of charged particles, which are basically leaving on a plane, but are forced to stay on a line. And the physics of the system is entirely different from assuming that they are interacting with a 1D Coulomb potential, which is linear. Okay? So we have a two-dimensional system of charged particles confined to a line. And this is different from having a one-dimensional system. Is that clear? Okay. What is the one-dimensional Coulomb potential? How does it go with the distance? How does it scale with the distance? One-dimensional? Sorry? So how does how does the how does the potential? Sorry? One over? In, in how many dimensions? In three. In three dimensions, it scales as one over r. In one dimension? r? No. So the electromagnetic potential scales as r in one dimension. It, it scales as log r in two dimensions. And it scales as inverse power of, of r in higher dimensions. Okay, so we need to have a two-dimensional potential to reconstruct this, this object, but your eigenvalues are real, so you, you are forced to constrain your particles to live on a line. So they live on a line, but they, they interact with the wrong potential, with a potential corresponding to another dimension. Okay? Good. So now, with, with this uh, intuition, we can ask our question. So question. For, let's say, a very large number of particles, what is the most likely configuration of your particles at equilibrium. So now we can again forget completely about random matrices. We have a problem in classical thermodynamics. We have a system of charged particles in two, dimension, in two dimensions constrained on, on a line, which are subject to two competing interactions, a quadratic confinement well and a null-to-all repulsion term. So what is the most likely configurations of these charges at, at equilibrium? How, how do we find it? What is the standard rule? 
This is the canonical partition function. So what, what shall we do? Sorry? The derivative of what? You said take the derivative, right? Well, yeah, but it's it's occupation probabilities. Uh, you will need you will need to have like a discretization of your real axis. Otherwise, you cannot say that that a certain box contains a certain number of particles. Yeah. 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 Excellent. Excellent. So y you see that that here. We have that if n is very is very big, then the inverse temperature doesn't really really matter. So whatever temperature you start with, the limit n to infinity will drive your system to the zero temperature limit. Indeed, at zero temperature limits, you don't have entropy, so your particles don't don't fluctuate at all. So the uh, the configuration that they will arrange themselves into is the configuration of lowest energy. Okay. So what is the configuration of your particles that minimize the total energy of your system? Well, what we have to do is to take the derivative of h with respect to lambda j and take this equal to 0 for all particles. Okay? Or equivalently, we need to force every particle to be in thermodynamic or mechanical equilibrium. So the force acting on a single particle must be balanced and must be equal to 0. OK? This is the precise definition of equilibrium. Otherwise, the particles would keep moving. Right? Just pretend and nod. <laughs> <laughs> they would like to take a picture of you. <laughs> you need a coffee? <laughs> Smile. Just do something. <laughs> Good. OK, so I assume that it is clear that what we have to do is to take the derivative of our energy function with respect to the position of each particle and equate it to 0 for all j from 1 to n. So if we... If we do that, we need to take the derivative of this object with respect to lambda j and take it equal to 0. Or actually, I put it lambda i, just to it's the same. So if, if you do that, then you get to this equation. So the most probable position of the uh, eigenvalue or the particle i should satisfy this uh, stability condition, j different from i, 1 over lambda i minus lambda j. So this is uh, a mechanical, basically a mechanical stability condition for your particles, which is obtained by imposing that the total energy of the, of the system is stationary. So it is the minimum, so the system will occupy the minimum um, amount, it, it will use up the minimal amount of energy that it, that it can if the particles are in this, satisfy this, uh, this equation. So they will not move from there because any, any deviation from this configuration will cost energy. Picture? Good. Now, the, the idea is to use this equation, which, which is valid for, let's say, large but finite n, to find an equation for the resolvent. We find an equation for the resolvent, we invert, we, we solve this equation, and we invert it, and then we get we access to the spectral density for the Gaussian ensemble. And then we compare this result with numerical diagonalization of, of matrices, and we see that we have, we have done the right, the right thing. Okay, so... Um, computing the equation is quite, uh, well, it requires just a couple of manipulations of this uh, stability condition equation. 
So for example, uh, in the left hand side, what we do is we multiply um, by 1 over n z minus lambda i and then sum over i. So here on the left hand side we have lambda i divided by n z minus lambda i sum i 1 to n. Okay, now I will use the green chalk. So I will now add and subtract z. So what you get here is lambda i minus z, which cancel with z minus lambda i and produce a factor of minus 1. So this object is minus 1. And then what is left is a factor of z times the definition of your, let's say, finite n resolvent. So you see that simply by algebraic manipulations on the stability condition, so the fact that your particles need to occupy the lowest energy level, we, we manage to get something in here which resembles, or which is linked to the resolvent. This is just by purely algebraic manipulations. Now we do the same thing on the right hand side, and we, at, in the end, we'll take the limit n to infinity, and we will get basically an equation for the, for the resolvent that we can then solve, try to solve. Okay? Now, if we do the same thing on the uh, right hand side, so let's, let's call R the right hand side of this, of this equation. So we need to multiply by 1 over n z minus lambda i and, um, and sum over i. So there is a 1 over n here and the 1 over n here. So in total, we have 1 over n square summation over i, summation over j different from i. Then we have 1 over z minus lambda i, 1 over lambda i minus lambda j. Now, it is quite easy to show that we, you can basically split these uh, two fractions here and rewrite this as 1 over z minus lambda j, which multiplies 1 over z minus lambda i plus 1 over lambda i minus lambda j. Why? Because if you multiply this to, so if you, if you do this, the sum, you get z minus lambda i, lambda i minus lambda j, and on top you get lambda i minus lambda j plus z minus lambda i, which is then cancelled by, by this guy here. So I'm just rewriting this, this product by splitting the two, the two fractions. And then what we have, basically, is the sum of two terms, A plus B. So we, we now analyze the two terms separately. So A. A is equal to 1 over n squared summation over i, 1 to n, summation over j different from i. And we have 1 over z minus lambda j, 1 over z minus lambda i. It's the product of these two guys here. OK, so what we, we can do here is we add and subtract the term j equal to i. So we have that this is equal to 1 over n squared summation over i, summation over j of 1 over z minus lambda, I, lambda j, 1 over z minus lambda i. And then we need to subtract the term 
where i is equal to j. So it will be summation i1 to n, 1 over z minus lambda i square. Right? I'm just adding and subtracting the term i equal to j. Just nod. Thank you. So this object here, we can split the two sums. So summation over i times summation over, over j. So this object here, together with 1 over n square, is just g n square of z. I recall that g n of z was defined as 1 over n summation over i, 1 over z minus lambda i. So here we have reconstructed the square of our would-be resolvent. It is the finite n version of it. And here, what we have is that this object here is plus 1 over n, the derivative of gn. So if you, if you differentiate this object with respect to z, you get a square in, in the game. But there is also a minus sign that will cancel out this, this object. So our first term a is equal to gn squared plus 1 over n gn prime. And now we work out what b is. Then we sum them up and equate the result to the left-hand side. So b, b is equal to what? It's equal to 1 over n squared summation over i 1 to n summation over j different from i, 1 over z minus lambda j, 1 over lambda i minus lambda j. Now, I will ask you to convince yourself that this object is a symmetric function in lambda 1, lambda n. Well, it's best if I, if I actually do it. So suppose that you take n equal to 2, and you try to work, work out what this, this guy is. Okay? So you just write it explicitly. So this would be 1 over z minus lambda 2. 1 over lambda 1 minus lambda 2 plus 1 over z minus lambda 1 times 1 over lambda 2 minus lambda 1. Just this, this object here for n equals to 2. And now you do the same experiment with this guy here. So we take what r was. So r is... 1 over z minus lambda 1 instead of z minus lambda 2, 1 over lambda 1 minus lambda 2, plus 1 over z minus lambda 2, times 1 over lambda 2 minus lambda 1. So if you compare this object and this object, you see that b is exactly equal to r with a sign difference. So there is a minus sign between the two. And this, this is just an example for n equals to 2, but it, it remains true for any n. So what you have is that b is equal to minus r. So now you have an equation for r. So you have that r is equal to a. So g n square z plus 1 over n g n prime z minus, so plus b, which is minus r. Which, which means that r, the right hand side, is 1 over 2 g n square z plus 1 over 2 n g n prime of z.
Now all you have to do is to equate the left hand side, which was this one, to the right hand side and solve the equation for, for G. Can I raise this? So the equation that we want to solve would be, in principle, plus 1 over 2n gn prime of z. So in principle, we, we could try to solve this um, differential equation. So let's classify this differential equation. It has, it has a name. Yes. Excellent. So this is a Riccati equation. from the name of the Venetian nobleman who first studied it. It's first derivative equal to a second degree polynomial. Okay? This is a Riccati equation. Fortunately, we don't even need to, to bother, uh, because in the limit n to infinity, since g, g of n is of order, of order 1, this object will be subleading in n, because it is divided by 1 over n. So what we need to do is, we discard the first derivative, and our differential equation becomes just an algebraic equation for the resolve. So what you have to solve is 1 half gn square of z minus z gn of z plus 1 equal to 0. And since we have taken the limit n to infinity, we just cheat a bit and we replace this object with our proper resolvent. Good. So you have uh, a second degree equation, which is solved by this object. So now we know what we have to to do, right? So we have to compute g at x minus i epsilon, and then take the imaginary part of it, and then divide by 1 over pi, and then take the limit epsilon to 0. Quite a lot of things to do. OK, I will do it in two minutes, so that we can start afresh tomorrow. And also, you get your first spectral density computed. So g of x minus i epsilon is equal to x minus i epsilon plus minus square root of x square minus epsilon square minus 2 plus i minus 2 x epsilon. I just put x minus epsilon here, raised it to the power 2, and then separate real and imaginary part of the radicand. OK, now lemma. So the principal square root of the complex number a plus ib is p plus iq. So this, this lemma gives you, so if you have a square root of a complex number, we can write this principal square root as a complex number, so p plus iq. And there is a formula that connects p and q to a and b. OK? Maybe you know it. 
but it's not so easy to find. So this is the, the real part, and this is the imaginary part of a principal square root in Cartesian coordinates. <clears throat> so I let you I let you work work this out for this square root. So what you get is that in the limit epsilon to 0 plus, the result is equal to plus minus sine of minus x over pi root 2 square root of x2 minus 2 minus x2 plus 2. So you see, you have to take another square root in, in here, which will become a perfect square in the limit epsilon to 0. So you have an absolute value in here. And then you have your, your result that if absolute value of x is larger than root 2, the density is 0. And if the absolute value of x is smaller than root 2, the density, rho of x, is equal to 1 over pi root 2 minus x squared. Have you, have you seen this law before? No? no? OK. So it has a name. So it is named after Wigner again. So it's called Wigner semicircle law. Why is it called semicircle? Yeah. Sorry? So? Why is it called a semicircle? Except that it is not true, right? So this is not an equation of the semicircle. Yeah. It's a semi-ellipse. Yeah. But for some reasons, it's called semicircle. <laughs> OK? So, so your density, your energy, your average spectral density assume this semi-elliptical low for Gaussian ensembles for any beta in the large in the large end limit. And actually, you can check this. On page 7, you find a comparison with a numerical diagonalization of uh, Gaussian, Gaussian matrices. So if you remember, at the beginning, we rescaled everything by root beta n. So if you rescale your eigenvalues that you have sampled in your, in your uh, numerical code by root beta n, then the curves collapse on this semi-ellipse semi very very nicely, okay? which means that on average you will have positive, half positive, and half negative eigenvalues, and uh, most likely the eigenvalues will be around zero. So there is a higher probability of getting eigenvalues around around zero. Okay, just try to. There is the code here. You can try in MATLAB to reproduce this this nice picture. See you tomorrow. <laughs>